Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Okay, we outlasted Maury Povich and Connie Chung. Oh, are they off the air? They're gone. She, uh, she, she sang, uh, it, she was dressed in a white gown and sang an excruciatingly awful version of Thanks for the Memories. Because they went on the air about the same time as we did, and now they're gone and we're still here. That's right. It's, um, it's, it's a pretty telling contrast. Yeah. No, I, I may do a victory lap here. You know, Mickey, I've got some bad news for you. Okay. Well, it, it has to do with yesterday. You know, as you may know, Phil Mickelson lost the U.S. Open by double bogeying the 18th hole. And that so traumatized me for reasons I won't go into that I reaffirmed a very recently made commitment to start meditating twice a day instead of just once. And Jesus. I think that's going to render me just about unflappable. We're into day two here, and I think you're going to have a lot more trouble getting getting under my skin with, you know, Ann Coulter-type stuff. You resolved to meditate because, uh, because so, you do, so you wouldn't ever double, double bogey a hole like Phil Mickelson? No, no. For me, a double bogey is good news. Okay. Um, I, I would welcome that. But um, it, it just, I, I needed to meditate to get over the, the trauma. Um, and in general, I'm, 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 I'm not satisfied with my equanimity. I want to, I want to, I want to ramp up my equanimity. I uh, want to grow more impervious to your gratuitous assaults. Well, I, and I, and I, that's what I, I'm going to do. I had heard from you for a while, and I thought you were probably annoyed that I had written on my blog that you were probably more irritated than, than you thought you were in the last discussion of Ann Coulter. So. No, no, I was just off. I was on a higher plane. That's why you didn't hear from me. And okay, good. from now I, on, you know, you, you bring up that Ann Coulter stuff, and I'm just going to say, oh, um, like that. Well, I, may I may bring her up. Oh. Um, so, okay, okay, okay. Well, I always assume you're on a higher plane. Thank you. So, so what uh, are we going to talk about? Uh, this this uh, alleged uh, Daily Coast scandal that's the either coast. rocking the blogosphere or failing to? I can't tell if it's rocking the blogosphere. It's getting a lot of p play. It, it didn't make the note, which I thought was a bad sign. Uh, the word Cazola is is being used. I think it's being used so often that we probably didn't think of it ourselves. Um, I, I wonder about that. I, uh, you know, we may be the originators of the term. I used payola, and then you shot back with Cosola. Right, I understand, but we would never we would never boast about that. No, we're not the type. We're not but, but let's just reflect on it in what? a, a self-aggrandizing well, way. I mean, not... I've seen it in print since. Have we seen okay. it in print before? We'll no, check. I was gonna I was gonna search for it, but I didn't. We'll check. Okay, now what's the um, background on this on this? So thing? basic basically there are these there are these two big bloggers who were the who who wrote a book called uh, Crashing the Gates. Uh, Marcos Mulitsas, who is the Coes of Daily Coes, and his buddy Jerome Armstrong. They had a cons consulting firm, but uh, as we corrected, as you misreported last week, uh, the consulting firm has disbanded, so they no longer share. No, a I correctly firm. reported back. What I had what I had said during our, our our dialogue was that they still were part of a consulting firm. Right. That was an right, error. Right, right. right, that's what I meant. And, and, and it, uh, that's what led me to think there was at least a mini, not a scandal, but a, but but, and not even technically maybe a conflict of interest. But it did seem that if Mark Warner was paying Armstrong, and Armstrong and Coase were in the, had a consulting firm together, and Coase was writing favorably about Warner, that had kind of a, a, a an ugly taint. But then it turns out they had already dissolved the firm, so I, well, I'm backing off any suggestion of impropriety well, or the I'm, appearance thereof, but you persist in thinking not, that something's wrong. It, there's, there's still a mini-scandal, because he paid Warner hires Coase's buddy, and all of a sudden Coase uh, uh, starts talking up Warner, and, and maybe Coase didn't control the speakers list at his convention, but all of a sudden Warner gets this uh, starring role at, at the daily Coes, yearly Coase convention with, with, with uh, you know, you can... You can find distressed Coase bloggers who said, why did this guy who, who ordinarily is a sort of DLC type we wouldn't like, uh, why did he get, get all, you know, why did, why did he get this, uh, this, this uh, incredibly lavish welcome and treatment? And, and, uh, and so there was some distress. And, and so if, if Tom DeLay had had his buddy, you know, get a payment from a candidate and then DeLay has started to say nice things about it, we would say that's that's corrupt. It's not illegal. I, I, uh, you can't nail him on anything. I don't think I would just, say. Well, for, first of it, all, it, it shows how easy it's normal business as usual washed in corruption, and it shows how easy it is to fall into that, and how Coase is has 
it, rather than fighting it, has fallen into the same pattern. Now, wait a second. First of all, what they say, and Chris Swellentrop on his blog has a correction to this effect, is that at the yearly coast thing, a number of presidential candidates were invited to appear, and Warner showed up. I think that's what the what the corrected version is. And and Chris's blog figures in this in a different way that we'll get to, I guess. But the other thing is, um, you know, I I don't agree that there's much of a scandal if my for like if I'm writing a book about somebody, and then they hire you to do something. You're a, you're a buddy of mine. I mean intermittently anyway. Um, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I just don't see how I can be held accountable for that fact. I mean, I, I, it, it's just. Well, if all of us, if they hire me, and all of a sudden you switch, switch positions and start saying nice things about the person who hired me. Well, well was I mean, there such a sudden switch? Well, Coes would not normally have said wonderful things about Mark Warner being a DLC type. Uh, there was a sudden switch in the in the Sherrod Brown. Uh, race in Ohio where they bought Armstrong and all of a sudden Armstrong who had been saying nice things about Brown's opponent uh, all of a sudden uh, switched so there there was a definite market switch there wait they, they the bought Armstrong and he changed his tune you mean and Coe's changed his tune too uh, yes and Coe's did too and you can I document think, yes. all this or it has been documented I, 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 I'm pretty sure Coe's changed his tune oh, too yes I can point this allegation. we're backing off a little bit but I uh, but I will I will I will post a blog that that, that says that uh, and there were also <laughs> I can also link to a blog uh, of somebody at the Coe's convention who said why is Warner getting all this special attention uh, you know, this, this idea, I think, that he just, you know, took up an offer that others turned down, I'm not sure is, is completely true, or, you know, he maybe have known the ins and outs. But the point is, it's very, you know, it starts innocently enough. It starts with a guy who loves Mark Warner, going to work for Mark Warner, and influencing his buddy Coase to like Mark Warner. Uh, but then it turns out you go to work for some guy who maybe you don't like quite as much, and you influence your buddy. That's how Washington corruption starts. Uh, well, yeah, the, but it's the only technically is, the corruption. The point is, it's much more natural. It's much more natural than 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 the anti-corruption uh, stance of Coe's would lead you to believe. But, but Nikki, uh, it's, it's only it technically happens. corruption in Washington if you not only influence your buddy, the congressman, but actually give 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 him money or, or something. No, it is morally corrupt if you. It, 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 I'm not talking about legal and uh, legally. I don't I'm think you're even talking ethically. It's, really. it's morally corrupt if if you're a political activist and you say something you don't believe because somebody's paying you money. I think that's corrupt. Well, it's okay, not illegal. It happens all the time, but it's, it's it's the ordinary Washington sellout. Do we know that Warner mortgage... would not have been to Armstrong's liking ordinarily? Uh, it's it's it's. It, it, I can't make that charge. I can say that you can point to things where Sherrod Brown, the Ohio candidate, was not to his liking. Well, uh, and then all of a sudden he was. I don't know. I mean, or Brown's opponent was to his liking, and all of a sudden he wasn't. Uh, and and there's, I, there's suspicions about this all over uh, the left-wing blogosphere. And it's, you know, there are other aspects to it, too. Warder has suddenly taken out all these ads uh, on, you know, cash-starved, lower-tier Democratic blocks. Is that because the ads pay off, or is that because it's a subtle form of cash payment to these bloggers? Hard to say. Well, I mean, uh, as, I, interesting. as I told you a couple of months ago, I think Warner is just a nothing burger as far as I can tell. It, it wasn't clear to me, at least at that point, that he stood for anything whatsoever, and, and I, he was trying to figure it out. I don't find him an attractive candidate at all. I, I actually read a, a, an attack... Uh, uh, from the left on Warner, and I started to like him more. Oh, because so, it was from the left. Well, that, that yeah. process probably began when I started saying negative things about him, and it's just been building ever since in your mind. But um, but I still say ethically, I mean, in fact, after our last dialogue, when I had at first, you know, gotten all harumphy about uh, about the, the consulting relationship between Coase and Armstrong, I realized that technically, if Warner was enlisting Armstrong and not the consulting firm, technically you didn't have a clear ethics violation, even if the consulting firm still existed, let alone af after, as we now know, uh, it has been dissolved. But, um, look, right, but substitute Tom DeLay for Coase, and would the left make us think about it? Yes. Maybe, but 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 I but but I, I hope I didn't pay much attention to the to, to to the various Republican scandals, but I sure hope more was going on than that, and I think it was. And, and it doesn't it doesn't change your mind. in hotel rooms. That's another story. It doesn't change your mind that uh, Jerome Armstrong uh, uh, 
uh, was accused of t uh, touting a stock. Uh, well, that's in the revelation of Chris Wellentrop's New York Times uh, blog, yes. The Opinionator, um, yes. that, that years ago the SEC uh, accused him of touting uh, a stock and being uh, somehow compensated for it by the company whose stock he was touting. Right, and that's in the yes, and that's in the New York Post today too. Yeah, without attribution, I'm sure they got it from from the opinionator and did not attribute it. That's actually a, a clearer ethical violation in my mind than any anything you've talked about. That Although they had a lot, they, they had some some of their facts were a little different, and they had all sorts of other yeah, reporting. But, but, but I'm, I'm sure, sure they were alerted to the whole story I, I by agree. Chris's blog item, and and if and if that guy were intellectually honest, oh, his name is Roddy well, Boyd of the New York Post. Well, Bob, he would have acknowledged Bob, it. Bob, Bob, boy, we don't know that they could have both been alerted by the same anti-Jerome Armstrong source. Then I take that it happens back. a lot. That happens a lot. Then I retract everything I said about Roddy Boyd. <laughs> okay, good. Um, We're libeling people right and left here. The, uh, uh, but, but anyway, so a guy who touts a stock in exchange for cash uh, might tout a politician in exchange for cash. Yeah, well, there, it's that's just the kind suspect. of connection that's being suggested. It, it, it's, yeah. it's a little more than metaphorical, because the, true, because the claim is that uh, this says something about his character. And that he's doing something analogous. That's the claim, yes. but it's it's wouldn't hold up in court as circumstantial evidence. I mean, it's unproven. But all I'm saying is that there's a real s smell of that there might be something there. Okay, we'll keep it, track of that smell and update us periodically, will you? Um, and it's uh, it's also extremely penny ante. The sums involved would make uh, Tom DeLay laugh, I believe. You mean in the stock scandal, or no, in the in the the, 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 what, what, the amount it takes to corrupt the 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 the, the, the Coase crowd. Is pathetically small compared with the sums that it takes to uh, corrupt the Congress of the United States. Well, if you think the Coast crowd is cheap, you should try me. We should try. Let, let, we should start a corrupt Bob contest. Hey, won't be hard. Okay, I'll bribe you to a, to attack uh, evolutionary psychology. I'm um, ready. Okay. Uh, Somalia. Yes. Um, so the Somalia thing, uh, it was only a month ago that I found out that America was fighting a little proxy war in the war on terror in Somalia. Um, apparently there are these warlords that we were paying off because they were fighting this group called the Union of Islamic Courts, which was trying to establish uh, governance in Somalia, a, right. a, a place that kind of lacked effective government governance for a long time. Um, and I talked about it with uh, Jim Pinkerton on Blogging Heads TV, and although Jim's a conservative and I'm a liberal, we both agreed that we actually don't trust the Bush administration to be, in this case, wisely spending our tax dollars. Uh, and sure enough, um, the, the, uh, the warlords have lost, uh, and the, the consensus out there and the coverage is that our support of the warlords well, didn't make a decisive positive difference, may have made a negative difference uh, in, in, in uh, consolidating support for the Union of Islamic Courts, may lead, leave us in a slightly worse position in dealing with the Union of Islamic Courts uh, now. Um, I don't, I don't, it was cl clearly back the wrong side. It was an ineffective policy. It was not clear for me from the clips, uh, A, whether it actually hurt, and B, whether the population resents our interference in backing the warlords, they seem to be, they seem to hate the warlords. Be happy that some sort of order has been restored, but not take it out on the United States so much. The, the, yeah, the I don't know. There's, I there's, a, there's an interesting, uh, if reliable, uh, Knight Ritter story by Hannah Allam uh, that that I'll link to, whose lead is. Uh, it turns out that that, there, that Mogadishu's business community or uh, representatives of it had tried to talk the U.S. out of this policy months ago, and, and the lead is in early March 9, and Mogadishu's most prominent leader secretly flew to neighboring Djibouti and pleaded with U.S. military officials there to stop funding the warlords who were devastating the city. Backing the warlords, they said, would end up strengthening an Islamist militia with a shadowy, radical wing. That's the Islamist militia that has, in fact, taken over. The Americans ignored their warnings. Uh, and the le leaders' fears came to life this month. Now, I'm not persuaded that if we had not backed these these warlords, that the Islamists would not have come to power, um, because it sounds like there was just a vacuum, and, and a lot of people welcomed their assertion of power to the extent that it establishes order. It's very analogous to the Taliban situation, at least to that extent. The reason the Taliban was initially welcomed in Afghanistan was because they reestablished order, and, and apparently in Mogadishu, 
you know, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, uh, war, guys with guns would come in and take women and, and rape them and so on, and now that's that's ha happening much but less it, often. And it also seems, it, it's, it's also analogous to, uh, you know, people preferring uh, left-wing governments that establish order to disorder and chaos, but the Islamic version seems to be a little more, ben a little more, a benign and be hard to get rid of because they don't seem to interfere with the market economy to the same extent that left wing governments do. Now that's interesting. That's a very I mean, interesting if a, point. If a left wing government like Zimbabwe takes over, you can be pretty confident that it's going to be an economic basket case in a number of years. If a, if a, if an Islamic, you know, Islamic movement takes over and provides order, they're not going to be a you know an emerging industrial tiger in in a decade, but. It, it, they're not going to be a total basket case either, and that means they're harder to get rid of. That's interesting. I mean, the business people who initially appealed to the U.S. to change its policy were actually not supporting the Islamists. They were supporting a third party, this transitional government uh, that, I, I don't know, was not very powerful at the time. I don't know what the prospects were for it, but it is now holed up in some remote city, I, I understand, and, and is, you know, is not controlling the bulk of the country. But there is now this struggle for the soul of the Union of Islamic courts going on. There, there, there uh, were two stories about this, uh, one today in the New York Times, one over the weekend in the Washington Post, and apparently there are some kind of radicals associated with the movement who are going around telling people they can't watch the, the World Cup and they have to get their hair cut. Um, and then there are moderates who, who now, and this is where your point comes in, who now have the support of the business community in, in Mogadishu. Uh, and I think at this point the U.S., to give it some credit, is wisely not adopting a confrontational tone with the Islamists, and, and, and well, maybe they're, they're going to well, try to... Well, except they think we're bringing in the Ethiopians to, to invade them. The Islamists? Not, the Islamists accused us today of uh, a link you sent me of... Uh, encouraging the Ethiopians to cross the border. Well, my hope is we're not actually doing that and not encouraging yeah. speculation that we are, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and the other thing is, I, I, you would think this would be a, is this a case where we could kill them with kindness? In other words, they're not going to have nuclear weapons, right? So if we trade with them and, and sort of embrace them, doesn't that, does that encourage the moderate Islamists, or does that... Uh, gross them out with capitalist excess so that the fundamentalists come to power. I don't know. Well, I assume that the, first of all, the internal power struggle will probably be resolved before tra our trade policies have a, have a chance to kick in or any changes in them. I mean, but I think we should support the commercial community, which wants the moderates uh, to prevail, and it sounds like there's a chance that they could, and, and thereafter, in any event, I, th I really think whoever comes to power, yes, we should adopt your... Uh, you know your, what you what you the policy you just outlined, and at it's, least give it a chance. I think there's, you know, there, there, I, there, this kind of gets. I mean, you, well, first of all, you ask about nuclear weapons. Uh, apparently, all that's there that we might worry about is there are a couple of somewhat high-ranking members of Al Qaeda somewhere in Somalia. We think, and we'd like to track them down. But I worry that that you know we're seeing the persistence of this Bush administration obsession with. With tracking down every individual member of Al Qaeda, even if in the process, you know, we create a, a climate of opinion that's much more favorable uh, to terrorists. You know, one of these business leaders who lobbied the administration in March is quoted as saying, "We told the Americans if you contribute money this way, that is to the warlords, you create terrorists and extremists because people think you are fighting their religion." Um, and I fear that that's what's happened. I, I would counsel against assuming that. Somali business leaders in general are like a benign chamber of commerce bourgeois types here. Uh, I just don't know. It seemed to me that a lot of the uh, the terror money f uh, flowed around that area through Somali business people who sort of wired it to each other and used uh, these Islamic banks to get money to really bad guys. Well, it could be, but it is actually reported in one of these articles I'll link to that, in fact, the business community is supporting the moderate elements within no, no, right. that is the Islamist group. The, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting about this story is the Islamic course movement seemed to grow up very organically. In other words, it started in neighborhoods with these, these uh, courts dispensing you know, harsh but effective justice. And, and it grew and eventually has, has swept the entire capital. Is that possible? Can, can, a, 
can order spontaneously arise like that, or does it? Oh, order, to have... order spontaneously arises like that all the time. Absolutely, the warlords I mean, were a form of spontaneous order compared well, to complete chaos. I mean, that's that's the form it usually takes. This seems like a much more sophisticated form. Well, and a more and and, and a more benign one in, in terms of the amount of violence and, and, and raping and pillaging permitted. The the, right. the downside is the it is more in the realm of civil liberties right. and freedom but of it, expression. But it seems to me this is sort of what Donald Rumsfeld expected to happen in Iraq when we had no troops. Just all of a sudden the neighborhoods get together and they set up their own government and everything's fine. Yeah, except they weren't counting on the Islamist version of it. Um, no, no, I, I, I think it does often. Yeah, yeah, I think that is what happened. But then, it, the, then the movement, and it may have had a military component to begin with, but the allegation is that we actually made it more militaristic by helping to, to, uh, to, by bolstering the warlords, and now many of the warlords' weapons that we paid for are actually in the hands of the Islamists. Right. Um, Don't, but isn't it possible that we're going to discover in a month that it was all funded by Saudi Arabia, it was not spontaneous, uh, just the way the Taliban were turned out to have been set up by Pakistan? Could be that it'll be some combination of both. I haven't seen any suggestion that, that Saudi Arabia is. No, I just, I just, it, I just say that they, yeah. it's, it's hard for me to believe that it was entirely. Could, could be Al Qaeda that's funding it. I mean, I think right. that is is the kind of suspicion our government had. Although I haven't really seen that asserted. I mean, one one question that this gets at is the question of whether the Cold War is a good model for the war on terrorism. You know, this is something. Peter Beinert's big on this on call on on, on, on stressing the totalitarian aspect. Of this, uh, of, this uh, of the radical Islam, and saying right. that liberals should rally the way they rallied in the Cold War, this seems to me a case where we kind of follow the Cold War model. Okay, if these guys are our enemies. If they're the communists, if they're the totalitarians, then their enemies are our friends, and we're going to pay off our friends. It, it seems not to have worked out, and I don't know whether the moral of the story is that the Cold War isn't a good model, or that. Actually, the Cold War is a good model, but we should keep in mind that often what we did in the Cold War didn't work out well. You know. Well, I think the Cold War is a bad model in the sense that uh, Somalia, as a failed state harboring terrorist, can do us a lot more damage now than a you know a failed communist state could have done in the Cold War. Well, that's a good point. I mean, Vietnam tr really after the Vietnam War, the country of Vietnam didn't really do us any harm. That's an excellent point. So. I mean, I, I'm very down on both the, the totalitarian. I mean, they are to, the, the radical Islam is totalitarian in its governing ideology, but I'm down on the on the comparison with Cold War totalitarian states, which is a very different kind of animal, and also with the label Islamo-fascist, which I think people like Paul right. Berman use, which leads to I think somewhat the same kind of confused uh, response. But you're going to. But it is a genuine problem because you're going to be. St Given your non-aggressive po posture, you're going to be stuck with containment as as your policy. So you're going to have to figure out how to make the outcome as favorable as the Cold War outcome was. Yeah. Well, m my view is that that uh, there are things you can do to make it more likely that moderate elements will will come to the will, will come to control this movement. Um, and even if they don't, then the long run, the thing you propose, smother them with kindness and trade. Uh, maybe even some development aid uh, might moderate might moderate them over time. That that's De development aid. That brings up a pet hobby horse, and I'll be real quick about it. I think I've mentioned this before. Development aid just never seems to work. Trade seems to work, but you see, you know, there were these there are a bunch of quotes in the clip saying, "Well, we better really pour the aid into Somalia now to help rebuild it." Mm -hmm. Well. You know, I, I, it's not working in Afghanistan, and I don't see why it should work in no, Somalia. No, it works as patronage. It works, in, you know, as, as a way to kind of buy off leaders, and that's that's one of the reasons it doesn't work as aid, because they keep a lot of it, but, and just I, and dish it out to their own... Uh, I, you mean, I guess that's right. I mean, in Afghanistan, the, the, the people expected power plants. I understand why... Why can't we just go and build some power plants? I guess it's because the local Chisians don't want us to or something. I don't they know. Find it, they but, find I mean, it I, aid often, you're right, aid, aid often doesn't work. A um, uh, guy named William Easterly who writes about this, but I, I don't know much more than that. And, and, yet, and, yet, and yet countries all over the world are, co are constantly suckered into thinking, oh, well, if we side with the Americans, they're going to make our country bloom. And we just never deliver. I mean, I think the Nicaraguans, you know, went through in the, in the Contra vote, where they voted for the Contras against the Sandinistas. They sort of thought, 
now the American aid will make us all rich, and it didn't happen, although they didn't. Well, or maybe they, they just thought now the Americans won't be subsidizing right-wing death squads, which we had been doing. Uh, well, let's not go there. Let's not go there. Um, let's, go to, uh, let's go to Iran. Okay. And actually kind of to uh, China and Russia at the same time, as will become clear. I mean, this, is, this isn't a, big, a huge development in the Iran situation, but the context of it is, is kind of interesting. Uh, President Ahmadinejad was, uh, it was fairly widely reported that he uh, said some kind of encouraging things about our initiative on, uh, on, on their uh, nuclear energy program. He, he, he called the pro our proposal a step forward and said that, that he and his colleagues in Iran are carefully considering it. He also, um, and I don't know if he was asked about the Holocaust remarks uh, or not by the media or what, but in addressing them, he seemed to me to moderate his utterances a little, or at least to avoid repeating them. I mean, rather than say that it was a myth, he said, well, it's a, you know, he said, we've said enough about this. Uh, it's a question that should be investigated by independent, impartial analysts. Uh, some people reported this as being uh, a reassertion uh, of, his, of his claim that the Holocaust, uh, you know, that the Holocaust isn't proven. I, it's unclear to me, I'd have to know more about the context and the details of the translation, whether he was kind of trying to defuse it or not. Anyway, it seemed like a, a milder version, and he said, and this is relevant to the question of, you know, what, what he means when he talks about getting rid of uh, Israel, whether he means... He, wa he wanted sanctions ripped from the pages of history, too. Is that what you're about to say? <laughs> no. I was yeah. about to say that he said, quote, there are no differences between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. If he believes that, you would think he doesn't mean let's kill all the Jews. You, you would think when he says that the state of Israel uh, needs to be gotten rid of, he means as, as the state of Israel. In other words, as a Jewish state, as opposed to meaning the people inside, currently inside it should be killed. But uh, anyway, that particular sentence uh, what struck a moderate tone. It hasn't struck before. I, I think some of this is contestable. I'm not saying he's made a, a radical shift, but the context of it is what's interesting to me, before I get into that, were you a bit, were, were you interjecting? No, I was just going to say, isn't the explanation that he didn't want to offend his the Russians and the Chinese, who were the, his his key allies in warding off sanctions? Well, that's the interesting context. There's this thing, this group uh, comprising Russia, and China, and a few small Eurasian states. I think uh, many or all of which end with the syllable "stan," like Uzbekistan. It's a group called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, you don't hear much about it, but uh, on the right, um, it is sometimes, uh, th th there are fears about it expressed. I mean, first of all, it's called a club for dictators. Um, secondly, people worry that it could become some kind of rival to NATO. In other words, ultimately, I mean, it, I think it has already sponsored some joint military exercises, but there's no... Uh, th there's no commitment uh, of mutual defense among the members. It actually started as a, uh, uh, as a way of keeping peace among, I think, the constituents, the, the, the Eurasian nations, and now it has trade uh, dimensions and so on. There are people who worry about it, wonder whether it could be a benign force or not. In this case, I think it basically was. I, I think, see, Iran has observer status. It's not a member. And so the same is true of Pakistan and India. And I know Pakistan wants to join this group. Um, and uh, the, in this case, at least, I think Iran's aspiration to stay in good standing with this group led it to do what I think China and Russia told uh, Ahmadinejad they wanted him to do, which is, you know, don't make any more waves. My, my suspicion is that they actually had a talk with him, and that accounts for, for his tone. Uh, right, but, uh, the, the people who've, um, you know, been expecting Iran to get the bomb have said, well, he's going to talk tough, and then he's going to talk, uh, talk not so tough, and, and none of this leads me to think that he doesn't want to get the bomb or that he won't get the bomb. Oh, no, it doesn't, doesn't lead me to believe that either. It, uh, He'd like to, so, I think he'd like to get the bomb. So since that's what we care about, I don't see, I don't see how this no, affects it's, it's the just one way a, the other. Uh, I mean, first of all, I think if he doesn't get the bomb, it'll be, it'll be because of uh, the, the negotiations, uh, you know, the, the, this initiative or some, some further evolution of it uh, may be so persuasive that they won't get the bomb. And, uh, my point was just that, uh, you know, it has to do with, with the whole issue of whether we should welcome these you know, regional bodies of states 
that could conceivably exert a stabilizing influence in their region and elsewhere, or might not, or might be pernicious. We don't know. And, and people worry, especially when, when, when it, they consist entirely of authoritarian states. Although India has observer status, and it would be interesting if India actually joined. Uh, that, would, that would make me feel a little better about it. But in this case, at least, uh, I, I think th th they exerted uh, a benign influence, at least on the rhetoric. And I think in general, China has shown that it understands that it is not in its commercial interest to go around roiling the waters. Isn't it better if China exerts its power through a multinational group than if it just exerts its power by itself? My view is know, yes, be, but there are people on the right who really worry about these, this type of multinational group. I, I, um, am, I think regional bodies are good. I, I'd feel better if India joined this and there was one yeah. you know, democracy in good standing. I think it would be great if India and Pakistan joined. I'd like to see them in the same group. But anyway, um, so this is... This is uh, not a huge story, and, and his, his remarks uh, have been interpreted in different ways, but that's my take. Uh, cool. As you know, I'm an expert on foreign policy. I know. So that's I, why I, I always use me, you as my sounding why board. why I provided this extensive and erudite commentary, as you've been describing this. Um, uh, let's move on to something I, I know a little bit about, not a lot, uh, Democratic Party politics and how the Democrats can win power sometime in, in within our lifetimes um, they've been they've been doing very badly lately they they had this uh, they unveiled their uh, reversal of course uh, whatever it was called uh, agenda and it was roundly condemned it didn't even mention Iraq it doesn't mention national health care just talks about prescription drugs and the minimum and who, wage who is they in this case uh, Pelosi and Reed the the Democratic leader, they never say minority leader, but the Democratic minority leader uh, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, leader Pelosi, an inspiring figure for all Democrats. Uh, so even Frank Rich sort of uh, pissed on this, uh, this document. That's a bad and, sign. And the, also, the Democrats also did something that was stunningly cynical. Uh, they made a, the, in the Senate, they made a big stand. Democrats oppose amnesty for Iraqis who kill American soldiers. So here the Iraqi government is trying to buy off the Sunnis desperately to achieve some peace. Obviously, if you're going to send amnesty to somebody, it's going to have to be somebody who's fighting on the other side. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Democrats see a cheap uh, opportunity to score some patriotism points. Uh, and so they come out four square against this obvious thing that's going to have to happen uh, if we're going to have peace in Iraq. Uh, and that was pretty, do you disagree with that? I figured you'd agree with that. Uh, well, I, I, I agree that they, they should offer amnesty uh, to, to even to people who, who, who kill Americans, and it's going to be a, uh, an amnesty program with a chance of success. And it does sound like a reasonably cheap political stunt. It's, it's, it, it's a kind that's not unknown, you know, to, uh, on the Republican side either. I mean, it, it's interesting. The uh, during the Cold War, there was kind of this claim that cheap partisan tricks should stop at the water's edge. In other words, when you got into foreign policy, there was this bipartisanship. Uh, I'm not sure that was ever actually honored very widely. I just don't know. And, but, but I guess the premise of your criticism is partly that, right? That this is, you, you know, cheap political stunts are one thing well, in, social, in the realm of social security, but... Well, I don't care. I, it's just wrong. It, a, it's, it's a wrong position. It's a position they don't actually it's believe. It's the wrong position, I think, yeah. They don't actually believe it. I think you're it right. Muddy, it's, it it's, muddies their message. They're trying to, like, be say, we're more hawkish yeah. on Iraq than Bush. I mean, yeah. uh, how's that going to orient the voters? Uh, uh, so it's like a disaster on, on three fronts. And, of course, there was partisanship during the Cold War. I mean, the, the whole... You know, Republicans were more any communists than Democrats. There were a lot of elections about yeah, that. Yeah, I, so I do not support this Democratic yeah. initiative. Um, there was an interesting article by Ron Brownstein saying that, well, the Democrats will only really get their act together when they have power. Uh, and Brownstein is, is a very, very smart political reporter. I just thought he was like, there were huge this, holes in this theory. Uh, uh, well, for, I, I think we'll agree on what the most obvious counterexample is in recent political history, right? Uh, uh, you go ahead. I, contract I with America, 1992. Well, there are a lot of people who, who who say the contract with America didn't have a big effect on that election. I don't quite believe it, but it's a more plausible claim than 
than I thought it was when I dismissed it out of hand a few weeks ago. And, and, and anyway, for our younger viewers, that was uh, when, when the Republicans did not have power in Congress, right before the election, they, they, they got together this actual platform for congressional candidates, the contract with America, and ran on it. And at the time, it was credited with their electoral success. Right. Right, and and, there's a, and and Democrats now, a lot of Democrats like George Stephanopoulos say it didn't have an effect because if you looked at the ads that were running locally, uh, they didn't mention the contract. And, and I would say, well, yes, but that occurred in the national context where it looked like the Republicans actually had some solutions and were going to do something, as in fact they did when they took power. Uh, and the Democrats have nothing that powerful now. They just have Newt Gingrich's uh, suggested slogan of had enough. Uh, and I see... I see three problems with Brownstein's uh, theory. One is the Democrats are going to get into power, and they're going to have the same fruitless debates over what to do, except they're only, you know, if, if they had total power, and they're certainly going to have those fruitless debates if they have a little bit of power, which is what they'll get if they win back, say, the House. Yeah, in a way, in a way uh, power makes it harder to come up with an agenda, it seems to me. But. And it'll be, it'll be in the glare of the spotlight. And, 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 and you have to just, actually do it, if, you know. <laughs> right. Well, but if they just if they just win the House, they don't have to actually do anything. But they do have to figure out whether they want to obstruct or, or actually try to achieve something constructive. And uh, it seems to me that the, the two years of Speaker Pelosi might poison the, the public's mind on the Democrats again so that it sets the stage for a Republican winning the presidency again. So You think she's just it, not a winning personality? Not a winning personality. So And, 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 and doesn't have the strength to, to sort of, you know, take any sort of... Uh, Bold initiative like proposing a national health care plan that would work, for example. Uh, the, uh, the second thing is if you want to achieve anything, you have, in our system you have to have a huge head of steam coming into office. You have to have something like the contract with America where they said we're going to try to balance the budget and reform the welfare system, and that, those were the, their two big accomplishments. If they just said we want to do something different, they, probably, they might not have had those two accomplishments. Uh, so it seems to me if the Democrats want to achieve national health care, they're going to have to say, this is what we want to do when we're in office. Uh, and the, the reason is because, you know, any reform that we're doing is going to annoy some powerful interest group. Uh, and you have to have a big head of steam in order to, to crush them when you're in power. You can't just broker it out uh, once, you, once you've achieved power through some sort of vague uh, had enough type, uh, type platform. So that, th those are my objections to this idea that, well, we'll, we'll have power first and, and, and figure out what to do with it later. Yeah, well, my, uh, my question in kind of reading the Brownstein piece was, uh, uh, you, you alluded to this earlier, is it really the case anyway, it's kind of the contract with America question, the, the, is it really the case anyway that, in fact, local voters voting on a local congressperson candidate um, you know, care about some big national platform. I mean, I'm sure it varies from district to district. Often, I, I, I think they really don't. They have their issues, well, but and they, they want to decide whether this person is. It seems like a nicer person I, than, the, than than the rival. Right, right. right. But, but 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 if you look generally at like sort of what happens in the national result. In other words, do the Democrats retake Congress? Do the Republicans hold Congress? Uh, that sort of that sort of tilt, which may be a tilt of only like 10 percent of the voters does seem to be affected by national issues. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you look at every congressional election uh, recently, they've all been national elections. You know, the, there was the, uh, there's the new, starting with the Newt Gingrich one, then the next one was, uh, have the Republicans gone too far uh, on impeachment? Mm -hmm. That was a national issue, and the, and the voters basically decided, yes, they have. Uh, and the Democrats, uh, you know, the Republicans lost seats when they expected to gain them. Uh, Newt Gingrich was thrown out of power because of this national wave of revulsion. Uh, the Bush off-year election was about, you know, do we, are, are we going to be aggressive in the war on terror? It was a, the Karl Rove uh, war strategy. They, they've all been sort of conditioned by a national issue. This idea that all politics is lawful just is, is I think, not true I, I mean, I do, I do think that, that a, a had enough Platform, and that's the slogan that Newt Gingrich recommended, right, for right. the Democrats, which may, may mean it's really not a good idea since he's not a Democrat. Um, but it seems to be what they're selling. I, I think that can work under certain circumstances. I think one problem that, that Democrats running for Congress would face in trying to use it this time is that the, uh, the recriminations for what people are unhappy about have focused so intensively on the White House 
you know, Bush is the one who's been vilified, and, and I like to think I, I've done my share of vilifying, and, and, and I stand by all of it. But, I think um, you have, Bob. But, but that, that, you know, that, that does, I'm not sure what that does for a congressional candidate running. Um, right. Uh, the, um, I, I want to introduce an idea that I got um, actually from Ann Coulter, Bob. Oh. Which is an interesting idea. Just com- that's very impressive. Uh, she, she planted this idea. Um, maybe we should want to split in the Democratic Party. I mean, you know, we, what happened, we being who? We being well. Her line is she wishes Eisenhower had become a Democrat so that the debate would have been between the Eisenhower Democrats and the. MacArthur Republicans, and they would have had two, a center party versus a right party. The MacArthur Republicans? The MacArthur. General MacArthur. Douglas, General MacArthur, yes. Uh, and uh, and she, she'd rather have that choice than, than a choice between a left party and a right party. But my point is that, you know, if the Democrats, like, don't do very well in these off-year elections, again, if they blow it again, there's going to be, and Brownstein predicts it, there's going to be a huge orgy of recrimination. Maybe it's better if the whole thing splits up and comes apart and the Democrats split into a center party and a left party. Then we might get a center party uh, that might win. Well, uh, the only the Republican Party fragments somewhat, too. Well, right, that might happen, too. But the, the part that it's, it's, you would think it would be the losing party that would fragment. Uh, and so maybe, maybe, you know, after pelosi Unz. Uh, after Pelosi, some sensible people can can take over, and we can uh, the the people on the left, who, which is not the Daily Coast crowd, I don't think. I think most of those people are are they're not nearly as left as we think they are, but the, some of them are. Get rid of them, and uh, and have a Tony Blair like party. It's just a thought. It's it is just a thought, big, but I repeat, that, I mean, you're going to have to get some Republican recruits. Some Republican yeah, moderates yeah. are going to have to join this. This. Uh, oh yeah, and, and McCain would be the logical person to lead the centrist oh, party. Please. Except, except that he's a flaw. My enthusiasm just waned. No, but some, okay, well, Hegel. There you go. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, somebody like somebody like McCain without the objectionable elements that that we find him. Okay. You definitely, it definitely had, would have to be personality-led problems. Okay. I agree. And by I agree. the way, I would just like to repeat that I am not currently planning to run, Mickey. Uh, we know that that's just a canny way of calling attention to your plan. I have no plan at this time to run. <laughs> because that's not a Sherman-like statement. I'm perfectly happy just doing Blogging Heads TV uh, okay. and, and overseeing a sprawling media empire. And, and writing a book about God. That, too. And, and meditating twice a day. That too. How, isn't that, doesn't that prevent you from doing all those things, meditating twice a day? Well, the, the claim is that it makes you more efficient and so compensates for the time you spend meditating. Is that true? I think when it works, but I, I'm, I'm a spectacularly unsuccessful meditator. In fact, I'm not sure if I'm the world's most unsuccessful meditator, but I am certainly the world's most persistent unsuccessful meditator. I mean, I keep doing it. And, and as... as as uh, practiced meditators will know, one sign, the first thing you shouldn't do is judge yourself and say, I'm an unsuccessful meditator. So they're sitting out there thinking, that's your problem. You're, you're blaming hey, yourself. You're beating yourself up. You're being of, judgmental. I sense a slight obsessive quality. Oh. Um, which I, and I, you know, I know nothing about that. that would, that's completely alien to me. Uh, Should we move we have, the viewer email? Do we have that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Adam Adam D has a suggestion for uh, a T-shirt motto that co- that is a direct uh, fragment of a transcript from one of our dialogues. Apparently, I'm no expert, me either. That's apparently something you and I said. Another proposal from Kurt W is that we put deploy the moose on boxer shorts. Now, Mickey, uh, I think that might lead to a somewhat cheaper connotations for the phrase right. "deploy the moose" than we originally had in mind. You you use that in the you, you use that with those salacious connotations, but I think the Islamic courts movement wouldn't like that. No, I think uh, I just think that could lead to a coarsening of romantic discourse. Uh, and I'm against that. I'm against that. So no, no boxer shorts, buddy. Nice try. Uh, now, remember last time we quoted from that email who said uh, about you, dude is gold, 24 carats. 
Now we have one saying, the emailer was correct. Kaus, the dude, is gold. You should pay him more. We should pay you more. We should pay me more. We definitely can't pay either of us less. Another comment yeah, on that anything, is, is uh, oh, who was that? That was Ernst B. This is Mark B. And he closes his email saying, and making fun of someone for saying, dude, not cool, not cool. Did you think I was making fun of that guy for no, saying No, I didn't understand that email. We weren't making fun. No. Plus, yeah. I think, is dude one of those terms that is used in an ironic way, so it's kind of insulated from yes. criticism? You're always yes, joking it already when you has, say dude, right? Yeah, it already has two layers of irony built in. So. Dude. Um, there was also somebody who said that I was accusing Daily Coast people of being terrorists by saying that they were in Kazakhstan. I thought that was an incredible reach. Hmm, hadn't thought of that. It, it was just a... Uh, but I'm willing to back it. I'm willing to back that assertion. Back me? No. Back the attack on me. I'm willing to back the attack on you if I can get some kind of subsidy from the people who want, who, who want, who want me to be behind it. Well, you, they, you know, maybe Jerome Armstrong will send a few ads your way. I'm... I'm that maybe so. I'm, I'm available. I'm for you're sale. A you're a cheap date. Okay. Uh, there will be, we will be getting into Coast uh, again in the, in the course of this viewer email. I think we okay. will see a Coulter Coast transition, but first a little Coulter. Chris M. writes, Mickey's increasing need to plug in Coulter's stuff is getting downright grotesque. I know he's got some kind of thing for her or something, but can we keep the Coulter stuff to a minimum? The thing I like about Blogging Heads TV is that it's decidedly unlike the kind of cable shout show where two pundits are reduced to empty suits spouting one-liners at each other for five minutes. The kind of venue where a professional clown like Coulter thrives. Uh, that is true. That is, we, we are different from a cable show. But, but like a cable show, we have come to realize that Coulter is good for ratings. I mean, nothing brings in traffic like Ian Coulter. During Sweeps Week, it will be Coulter and Co's wall-to-wall. Uh, -wall. Yeah. So for that so. reason, I think I'll move on to some more Coulter email. Okay. Some more traffic-generating Coulter email. This, again, is to you, Mickey. As the Coulter email tends to be from Kyle D., who, is, if I'm not mistaken, has in the past made keen analytical contributions to our discourse. Kyle writes, I'm amazed that you will sit there and defend Coulter and then decide that Coase is a bad guy. Having met neither, I find this ridiculous. They are on completely different levels of over-the-top condemnable speech. Coase shouldn't have said screw him, but he was reflecting the thoughts of many soldiers and some of his fellow veterans who etc, etc, etc. And then he gets onto the, uh, the, consulting, the consulting issue, which we've covered. Here's another uh, emailer, the initials MDO, I, who writes uh, on the same contrast between Coase and Coulter. Two things are undeniable. Marcos Molitsas, that is Coase, typically engages in more or less reasoned analysis, notwithstanding his terrible comment about the contractors. Ann Coulter typically engages in crass generalizations, distortions of fact, criticisms of opponents' personalities and physical appearance, accusation of, di of disloyalty, ad hominem writing, at times approaching dehumanization and massive amounts of sensationalism. You might, would you concede that distinction, Mickey? No, not at all. Oh. There's a, there's a, one of us has made uh, remarks about people's appearances recently, Bob, and that would be you saying you didn't think Ann Coulter was attractive. So, Did I say uh, that? Yes, you did, and then you apologized for it because your wife made you. Uh, I'm but not sure I quite apologized for it. <laughs> I stand by that statement. No, you didn't say you thought it was wrong. No, I explained why I thought it was relevant in context or something. All right, no, I, mean, I, was a non, kind of, that was I a kind of said maybe I shouldn't have said it. That was a non-apology apology? I didn't realize that. I think I that was a non-apology apology. I didn't realize it was a fake apology. I think less of you now. I thought you'd actually genuinely apologize for that. No, I think it was fake. I thought it was a I'd have to go back to and check, but I think that was one of my fake apologies. But I'll check. Uh, I don't, uh, okay. Uh, but, uh, no, I think Coulter's smart, Coase is smart. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think one is under, operating on a higher level than the other. Oh, uh, om, 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 om. There. What about this Eisenhower point? That was a good point, for example. Was that an ad hominem point? No, it was an interesting, fresh thought. Um, that, I, that I've now stolen from her. Um, I have a question for you about Ann Coulter, Mickey. Um, and I think somebody actually wrote this in, maybe, but I couldn't find the email at the last minute. 
um, aren't you worried that now that you're virtually the only person who kind of actively defends her, as opposed to kind of refuses to condemn her, there's still a few people on the right who refuse to condemn yeah, her. Yeah, that was another bogus thing, that I'm supposed to change my position because the people on the right have, have deserted me? No, well, I'm why just should saying I care that about, as a... Why should I care what the people on the right say? Uh, well, I'm not if on you the right, let me Bob. finish my question, maybe we'll find out. The question is, aren't you worried that this will become just a way of discrediting you easily? Like, you'll say something and people say, you know, Mickey Cow says this, and the reply will be, yeah, he also says that Ann Coulter is making a constructive contribution to American political discourse. discourse. And the other person will go, oh, well, forget that. And I'm, I'm actually serious. I mean, I don't, I, I think uh, she is now so on the fringe. She has been abandoned by uh, just about every responsible person on the right I know of. And uh, isn't that actually kind of a concern of yours that, that it'll, you know, that it's one of these extremist positions that just casts a taint of discrediting much more widely? I haven't thought about it. Give it some thought. Uh, when it's not supposed to think along those lines. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for your benefit. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, here we go from uh, Terry W. Have you invited Coase for a Blogging Heads TV appearance? That would be an appropriate remedy for the off-base exchange between you and Mickey about Coase and the Coase community. If you already have invited Coase and Coase declined, shame on him. Mickey, we, I don't know if we have, but we do, right? We extend an open invitation. That'd be great. That'd be great. I mean, if he'll agree to link to us from his, like, you know, stratospherically trafficked blog, we will, uh... But I think he can come. He's allowed to come even if he doesn't link to us. He is, but we will, you know, we'll send a signal that we'd really think it was appropriate if he linked. Right. We'll send that signal. And also, so we do invite Coast. And also, Mickey, uh, I think we should offer one thousand dollars if the Beatles will will be reunited on Blogging Heads yeah. TV. But Bob, you won't allow Ann Coulter to come on. That's right. Not that not that she would. That's right. Uh, so you, 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 it's not like you're extending an open invitation for a robust dialogue. You draw the line. Between the Beatles and Ann Coulter? One said strawberry fields forever? Between Coase One said we should invade their countries, kill their leaders, and convert them to Christianity? Between, between Coase and Ann Coulter, you draw well, the line. Well, there is no comparison. He's not, he's not a nut. He's, he's not, he's not uh, cheapening American discourse. He, he's not a threat to national security. And, and this, this, this gets American back discourse. to, you know, you said in your blog, uh, Bob is pretending not to be uh, all that uh, exercised in this in this discussion of main culture, but he really is. No, I actually, I really wasn't, um, because uh, the uh, my, my camcorder just said change the battery pack, Mickey. But I'm not worried. Uh, I'm 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 sensing a rising level of indignation. Well, in that your signal voice. came on just in time and reminded me to say, oh, okay. that that that, that, that battery pack thing was like uh, was like Sid Hartha's way of, of reminding me. But, Should we? No, the thing she said about the 9-11 widows, by the way, if my camera does die, I've enjoyed this dialogue. Okay, the thing she said about 9-11 widows did not threaten the national security. The stuff, it, it's when she uses ethnic uh, slurs against Muslims. It's when she says we should invade their countries and convert them to Christianity. That is the kind of thing that could antagonize uh, Muslims, including Muslims who live in the United States, could lead to homegrown terrorism. She is a threat to national security. I don't see how Coase is. It would be a little more of a threat if she held government power as opposed to just no, no, uh, saying because, what she No, no, because thought. she allows them to say, look, this is accepted discourse in America. Elite, because she still goes on the Today Show, she still goes on, you know, MSNBC, whatever, even if she's no you longer think, a consultant. You think she nobody, goes, should, nobody should be able to claim that Islam is not a religion of peace, that that should be banned from discourse No, I didn't America. mention that. People who use ethnic well, slurs point, of point. any kind an should be banned thinks, from polite discourse. She thinks Islam is not a religion of peace, and uh, Mickey, I if didn't you're going to have up. peace, what are you talking? Who are peace, you talking to? I, and, Mickey, let, hello. Bob, let me, Bob, let me finish my sentence. And she, she thinks it's not a religion of peace, and if you're going to have peace, they're going to have to change their religion. I don't agree with that, but I don't think she should be read out of the public square. Because that's what she thinks. No, we but, but, but we Mickey, the ethnic slurs, their, the ethnic slurs, Mickey, calling them ragheads, well, that, that is the, a threat to our national security. That's the, you only, that? that's the only ethnic slur you, you can come up with, is this one thing where she said ragheads. And, and did not apologize, and did not, no, she you know, uh, and, and we've, yeah, we've that is this, a threat to our national security. If, they, this, if, they, if terrorist recruiters can go and say, 
that they have this special derogatory term that respected opinion leaders in America go around uttering on, you know, uh, wherever she was, and they are welcomed on mainstream TV shows, and people like Mickey Kaus defend them and say they're making valuable contributions to discourse. That is a threat to America's national security. I didn't security. say the ragheads think it was a valuable contribution to discourse, and you, do, you wouldn't let her on even before she said ragheads. You're just an intolerant person, that's all. Oh. Um. Okay. You're not intolerant. I'm just pointing out that, that, that this offer to Coase is, a, is not just a general offer to anybody. It's a, No, I, and look, Ann Coulter, I, for reasons I've articulated again and again, is in a special category. She should be stigmatized. Absolutely. I, have I been unambiguous enough about that? No, I think I think you've been a broken record about it. I, think, I can't believe our viewers want to hear this again. Neither can I. You're the one who brought it up. Who acted think, as if there's, you know, that I had never articulated some distinction between her and Coase. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that, then. Your apology is accepted. Uh, and it's a real apology, not a fake one like you do. I appreciate it all the more, then. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have any more viewer mail? Um, wait, let me see. Uh, uh, or, I regain okay. my equilibrium more quickly now that I'm meditating twice a day, even Maybe. if occasionally I grow. Well, finally, yeah, one more. Okay. There's, you know, Daily Coast. Uh, I, I don't understand the entire structure of that blog, but apparently there are people who are designated as diarists, and I guess they're different from people who are kind of regular bloggers. I don't know. But there's a diarist on Daily Coast whose uh, handle is Kidney Stones. He has been very generous about linking to blogging heads, even if sometimes he does it by way of criticizing blogging heads. We got this email to this effect, noting that he's been linking to us, and the, the right. subject is... Kidney Stones promotes Blogging Heads TV. Now, I just worry that if this gets out there and then it gets kind of garbled, uh, people will think that Blogging Heads TV promotes Kidney Stones, and I just want to deny that, Mickey. It, I mean, you know, high blood pressure, indigestion, maybe, but watching Blogging Heads TV does not promote Kidney Stones. That's my last um, word on the subject, and we appreciate Kidney Stones linking to us. Yeah, I think you, I think you actually read one of his emails earlier, so... Yes, not as coming from kidney stones, but as no, coming we from... we didn't know it was from kidney stones. We didn't know he was kidney stones. Now we're all the more but flattered. That's very clever kidney stones wordplay. Hey, thanks. It's, I uh, think it's the kind of thing people come to our site for. Uh, yeah. Uh, in Hollywood, you could really make a lot of money. I don't know why you're not here. Sort of writers like you. Um, uh, so I think we should end this before your battery dies, don't you? You mean my battery in the sense of... Either way, either okay, sense. Okay, okay. Your, your camera yeah, you're right. battery or your, your mental battery. Okay. Well, with my equanimity completely unruffled by anything you've said, I bid you adieu. Uh, cool. Okay. Peace. See you around.